let me ask you a simple, straightforward question. What is safety? Stop, take a second, think through in your head, what is safety? Now, I'm willing to lay money, and if enough of you are watching, I'm going to totally clean up on this one, that your answer to that question was expressed in terms of outcomes. Something like, safety is when everyone goes home at the end of the day unhurt. Or safety is the absence of harm. Or the, possibly you went a little bit more backwards in the causal chain and said, safety is the absence of unacceptable risk of harm. But always looking towards that end result. We're safe if something bad hasn't happened. Now that's a great hindsight definition of safety. But even then, it's quite limited. If you wandered through the day with someone pointing a gun at you every moment and you got home unharmed, would you say that you'd spent the day safely? If a worker was up the top of a tall bridge with no safety equipment, no attachment points, but somehow they got down unhurt, would you say that they were safe the entire time? So, unless you answered yes to all of those questions, which I'm kind of hoping you didn't, then an outcome is not sufficient to describe what safety is. But on the other hand, we can't switch to the whole other direction and say that safety is all about actions. Because if that worker was up the top of the bridge with all of the right safety equipment, they were carefully attached to harness points the entire time, and yet they managed to break both legs anyway, you still wouldn't say, well, they were safe. So, actions insufficient, outcomes insufficient. If someone had the equipment and they got home at the end of the day uninjured, but they told you that they were desperately scared the entire time, that they were not happy with their work environment, would you then say that they were safe? Okay, so possibly feelings have something to do with this as well. And feelings aren't enough either, because someone could tell you that they're perfectly safe, tell you that they feel safe, tell you that they're happy that their organisation looks after their safe, and that could pretty well be characterised as complacency, which is not remotely safe. So in fact, safety turns out to be this concept, which is rather difficult to pin down. It's sitting somewhere out there and we can see lots of things that are associated with safety, that are linked to safety, that cause safety or are caused by safety, but are not the full complete understanding of what safety is. So some of these are fairly straightforward to talk about. So there are actions that are certainly associated with safety. If we didn't believe that there were things that you could do to keep yourself safe or to help others to be safe, then we wouldn't really be interested in safety as a topic at all. There's certainly a role that equipment plays in safety. There are times when people are unsafe because the equipment that they're dealing with is unsafe. No matter what your actions are, if you're working the entire day next to a sharp bit of metal, then there's a good chance that you're going to get hurt. Outcomes certainly have got something to do with safety. If it weren't for the fact that there are some outcomes that we're not willing to accept and that those outcomes sometimes happen, then again, we wouldn't be interested in safety. But we can't tell the presence or absence of safety just by the immediate short-term outcomes. And often the long-term is just too long for outcomes to be a useful way of thinking about safety. For very, very low high consequence risk, there can be organisations that are very unsafe but never have a major accident. So outcomes, not quite enough. Feelings certainly can both cause safety and be caused by safety. You can feel unsafe and therefore behave in a safer fashion and therefore end up safer. On the other hand, feeling unsafe, you could argue, have you actually been safe the entire time at all if you didn't feel safe? Attitudes slightly different to feelings. It's more your approach towards risk. Do you want to be safe? Do you think that safety is important? When you're making a trade-off, do you tend to err towards the side of achieving other goals or achieving the goal of not being hurt? 
No one sits completely at one end of the spectrum or the other, but certainly different people in different organisations can have different attitudes towards risk. A lot of the things that threaten us, in fact, come from outside our immediate control. They're in the environment, the things that we didn't design, the things that we can't impose requirements on. But they certainly affect whether we're safe. And our actions create the environment for other people's actions and for other people's safety. Documents themselves are in fact part of what makes safety. You'd be hard pressed to say that an organisation, at least a large organisation dealing with high risks, that did not conduct some sort of safety processes such as risk assessment was a safe organisation. And the absence of any documentation of those activities kind of questions whether those activities exist in any meaningful sense. So documents may in fact reflect the presence of safety. And if those documents influence training, if they influence behaviour, if they influence attitudes, feelings, environments and outcomes, then those documents themselves may be responsible for creating safety. But none of these things is safety. Safety is something else. It's something that exists in the complex interaction of these things. They each cause each other, they are each caused by each other, they each cause safety and they are each caused by safety. So this isn't to say that safety is not a real thing. There are plenty of things like this that you can't completely pin down but that doesn't stop them existing. So when you hear people say things like, well, if it can't be measured, it's not real, or if it's real, then it must be able to be measured, that's nonsense. Yes, safety is real, but because it exists as a complex interaction of things, then any individual way of measuring it is not actually going to measure the thing that we think of as safety. Any control over these individual things is not going to control safety. And in fact, if we start to push too much on any one of these things, if we start just to measure outcomes, and then we just start to control outcomes, we start to lose track of those other things that make up safety. If we just focus on the documents, then we start to lose track of those other things that make up safety. So one of the clearest examples of this, I think, is the idea of safety culture. Now, safety culture is clearly a real thing. Organisations have culture. Culture varies between organisations. Generally speaking, but not always, the attitudes of individuals within an organisation are closer to each other than they are to attitudes within other organisations. So we have in-groups and out-groups, which is a great way of characterising culture. And it stands to reason that not all of these would be identical when it comes to promoting safety. That you could identify perhaps which organisations were safer by working out which cultures were more correlated with safety. Hence, safety culture measurement. But then we have to ask the really interesting question, which direction does the causality go in? Do organisations which have accidents tend to have particular cultures? or do organisations with particular cultures tend to have particular accidents. And there you have the weird thing that it turns out that safety culture is actually a better lagging indicator than leading indicator. It's better at telling you what an organisation was in terms of safety outcomes than what an organisation will be. To the extent that it predicts what the organisation will be, this is very much the same as past performance predicts future performance. So this presents a real challenge when it comes to wanting to investigate what causes safety, how we bring about safety, how we manage safety. Because it's certainly true that management, at least any sort of scientific approach to management, requires some sort of feedback. You have to have some way of knowing whether your activities are doing any good or not. You have to have some way of throwing out the bad ideas based on whether they are in fact bad ideas. But safety can't be directly measured. All of the measures that we have are proxies, they're surrogates. They're not quite what we actually want to know. So they're gonna be useful if they're things that we can reasonably measure. They're gonna be useful if they're things that give us lots of data points. And they're gonna be useful if they accurately reflect the state of safety. 
And as we're going to see, there are things that meet the first two of those criteria, which form a lot of safety practice. But that third one is always going to be a big question mark. So let's go through a couple of the common beliefs and understandings of what safety is and how this translates into practice. So here's one model which suggests that we can look at safety by looking at those things which are outcomes. And the most common outcome that we look at is the one that gives us the most data points, which is lost time injuries. Why lost time injuries? Well, just because it then puts a clear line between what counts and what doesn't count, or at least is supposed to create that clear line. So our model is that if you don't have safety, then you have more minor injuries and you also have more serious life-changing injuries. And if we measure the minor injuries, that tells us how much safety we have, which tells us how much risk we are at those major injuries. As a result of this sort of thinking, we start aggressively responding to small events. We have policies that talk about zero harm, that no accident is acceptable. We let no accident go uninvestigated, and we let no investigation finish until we've been able to provide clear answers and recommended actions. But just think very, very carefully about this model. The underlying assumption here is that minor injuries have different causes to good outcomes. Because if they didn't have different causes, then they wouldn't be useful of telling us the existence of safety. But on the other hand, there's also this assumption that they have the same causes as major injuries, because we're assuming we can predict and control major injuries by controlling the minor outcomes. So in fact, this model has quite an incoherent understanding of its own internal logic. It's claiming that outcomes require, different outcomes require different causes, at the same time as saying that different outcomes have exactly the same causes in the same proportions. We won't go more into the problems with lost time indicators here, but that fundamental problem, that fundamental logical flaw, is at the gap of all of the different ways in which LTIs can be exploited. Here's another common belief. This comes out of the certain strands of the behaviourist or behaviour-based safety movement. The idea that safety is a choice. That people can actually choose to be safe or choose to be non-safe. The underlying model is that people's attitudes lead to their actions and their actions lead to safety. If we can change their attitudes through a strategy of positive and negative behaviour reinforcement, yeah, let's go back to the 1940s Skinnerism, then we can make them safer. Now, the assumption here, of course, is that we know what the good choice is. And not just we, but someone that we've hired for the express purpose of telling someone else how to do their job, who doesn't do the job themselves, is typically less qualified and educated in doing the job, can then tell the person who is expert in the job what's the good choice and what's the bad choice. And even if this was a reasonably logical approach, even if we could in fact improve safety by this sort of intervention, and slight spoiler alert, in the short term you actually can, this is short term very, very effective. The trouble is that it removes focus from the other reasons why people do things and the, all those other aspects of safety. So those short term returns come at quite a cost in terms of workplace productivity, quite a cost in understanding what the original cause of the risk that you're managing through worker actions is. And so it sacrifices a lot of other opportunities to improve safety. Those short term gains start to level off. The only lever available is to double down on more behaviour based interventions, which starts to have diminishing returns. Um, productivity continues to decrease, but safety doesn't increase. And the underlying risk of the major accidents hasn't in fact changed at all this whole time. But we've convinced ourselves that we're putting a lot of effort into safety. So that big accident comes as a quite surprise. Here's another one that you might have heard of in various forms that suggests that in fact, ultimately, safety comes from people's actions mediating the threats that come in from the environment. So the environment presents danger. People have a certain level of awareness of that danger. 
that awareness guides their actions which creates safety. If people feel too safe, then they're just going to compensate by behaving more dangerously. So if we want to change people's safety, then we need to make them more scared. We need to put a spike in their steering wheel instead of advanced brakes in their car. Now, the assumption here, of course, is that it assumes that all risks are immediate and obvious to people, that their safety is in fact dictated by those risks that they can see and react to. It ignores all of those risks that people don't even factor into their decision making. And it also removes the focus from actually reducing the source of the danger. Because you see, this sort of logic does in fact suggest that you should put a spike in people's steering wheels. And that's not just a metaphor, that's actually where the logic leads. So it's a hint that there's something actually wrong with the underlying logic here. And what's wrong is that, yes, people do change their behaviour in response to perception of risk, but it's never quite to the level of the actual changes in the risk itself. And so putting the spike in the steering wheel makes people more cautious, it makes them feel unsafe, but that's quite justified because they genuinely are at much higher risk and no change in personal behaviour is going to compensate for that higher risk. So, pretty obvious, that's why we don't put spikes in steering wheels. But it's also why we do put advanced braking systems in cars, even though people do drive a bit more aggressively once they're in place. Yes, this mitigation is not as effective as we'd like it to be because the behaviour compensates, but it still doesn't mean it's not a good idea to put the mitigation in place. Another common belief that some people have and other people question but still go along with, this idea that safety and compliance are highly related and similar things. So the assumption here is that the ultimate source of safety comes from a model of how the system should work as described in a suite of documents. That suite of documents then controls the equipment that people use, the actions they take, and those equipment and actions, those frontline effects, are eventually what drive safety. We can keep people safe if we get those documents right, and then make sure that the actions and equipments comply with the documents. The underlying assumption, of course, is that there is some perfect model of what the documents should look like. That people know what safe is, that people who write safety documents know how work should be performed in all its myriad of variations, and we just don't do it sometimes, so we should be made to do it. It suggests that people don't have reasons for their actions, except that they choose to be non-compliant, forgetting that those other reasons may in fact be quite legitimate reasons. Now, just in case you thought that this was a talk just critiquing some of those old notions of safety, outdated nations, notions of safety, and I'm going to tell you next that in fact there are grand new evidence-based better ways of doing things. No, there are no right answers here. So here's another one, the idea that safety is resilience. Let's stop focusing on safety and just focus on doing work well. Because really, safety is just one of a range of outcomes that comes out of work. The environment creates the risk, our actions and equipment control it. But really, if we just focus on doing work well, promoting success, getting positive outcomes more often, then naturally the lack of bad outcomes will go along with it. But this is anathema to the whole idea of managing organisations. Because it suggests that sure, you can manage cost and finance, that's fine, you're allowed to have people who are skilled in that, expert in that. You can manage schedule, you can manage quality, but somehow safety has a special status as an outcome. It is uniquely unmanageable by concentrating on it as a particular emergent property of work. You see the contradiction there? We're saying don't focus on safety because it's just an emergent property the same as all these other emergent properties. So just concentrate on successful work. But now we're saying it has a special status. It's not just like those properties. It's in fact something that unlike the others, we shouldn't be deliberately managing. So simple answers, simple models, all lead ultimately to inherent contradictions. Safety is something which is real but complex. The moment you try to pin it down to any one thing, to any one easy answer, 
Whether that's an answer that comes out of the 1930s or whether that's an answer that comes out of the latest guru that's talked to a conference near you or promoted a book recently, simple answers ignore a lot of what makes up safety. They ignore a lot of the things that need to be balanced. They discard the options associated with all of the other levers available to us to manage a situation. So what does this mean when it comes to measuring safety? It means that no individual metric is a good indicator. And it also means that if you start to measure based on an individual indicator, then what's going to happen is you're going to skew safety rather than improving it. Even things which appear to be quite reliable correlates with safety outcomes, the moment you start measuring them, they stop becoming reliable correlates. That's deeply frustrating, but it's the way it works. So consider any particular safety activity. So let's say doing investigations or doing take fives, those stop, take a moment before you do a task. There are lots of things about that you could measure. You could measure the volume. You could say, well, how many investigations do we do? How long do they take? How many take fives do we do? How many of these have we filled out? How much do these accumulated piles weigh? We could measure the quality. How well are these activities performed? We could look at the investigations and see have they produced useful results. We could see how many take fives have actually caused people to change the way we're doing something. We could measure the attitude associated with them. Are people actually doing these with a full understanding of why they're doing it and achieving the results we want to achieve? And then we could look directly at the effects. What changes as a result of doing these activities? And the point is that measuring any one of those things, those other things will start to get out of whack. People will start focusing on what you're measuring and not on what you're not measuring. So any sort of measurement for safety needs to consider the full range of things in order to be useful. What are the implications for managing safety? Well, the end result is that safety becomes particularly vulnerable to trendy ideas. When you have something that is so nebulous, then it's very easy to fall into the trap of feeling frustrated and confused. And when someone comes along with a clear and authoritative answer, then jumping onto that, not necessarily because you like simple answers, not because you're stupid or deceived or simplistic, but simply because you're deeply frustrated with being in a constant state of not knowing whether what you do actually helps people. When someone says, look, I've got something, I can show that it does genuinely help, it's pretty easy to jump on board. So consider things like zero harm. Starts off vague idea published in an academic paper back in the late 1950s soon becomes a fairly deliberately designed policy with lots of good aspects, good elements to it, but with a banner headline, Zero Harm by 2012. Other organisations see the banner headline, oh, great idea, let's jump on board. And soon we have organisations who will only recruit people who are willing to commit to a zero harm policy with no real clue of exactly of what zero harm means in terms of practice, in terms of policy, or what effectiveness those practices and policies have. Consider how widely spread the Swiss cheese model is, despite the fact that James Reason himself has critiqued the original versions of the model, has challenged the way it's being used, has insisted that people aren't getting the point of the model that he's promulgated, but how happy people have been to spread, adopt, put on PowerPoint slides, the Swiss cheese model. Consider good choices. Um, comes originally as a flavour of the behaviour-based safety movement. Starts off, perhaps, as an interesting psychological intervention, but becomes a whole way of thinking about safety that dominates organisations' entire approaches. Until after time, they realise that those short-term gains are not paying off, the trend falls away and they look for the new best thing. Now, none of this says that gurus don't matter, that having some sort of expertise in safety isn't a good idea, that understanding the full range of history, the full range of ideas, and the evidence for and against those ideas is not important. As with any human endeavour, expertise does matter, but identifying true expertise is pretty hard. So here's the bottom line. 
where do you get from this complex notion of safety to the struggle to identify expertise in safety? Well, experts have questions, they don't have answers. Someone who comes and tells you that they have an answer to safety, you know, has narrowed down the bubble of ideas to one or two simple answers, one or two simple levers, and you know that's not enough. The picture you're looking at behind me is a plant run by DuPont. Uh, DuPont had a large impact in the practice of safety around the world. They didn't just manage safety for themselves, but they packaged and branded their approach to safety to sell, to spread, to evangelize as the way of doing things that significantly improved safety. And it's not sufficient as an answer. The picture on the right, that's a gas leak that killed four people. Two people killed when the gas leaked, two other people killed giving their lives heroically but not at all safely to try to rescue the original two people. Safety is complicated and the only way to make progress in safety is to embrace that complication, to accept that sometimes the answers we have are just more questions.